Our good old solar system is actually a pretty bizarre place. Well, with all its out-of-this-world phenomena that we humans haven't managed to explain yet, there are rumors that a gigantic, undiscovered planet is hiding behind Neptune. Volcanoes on Pluto spew ice. And a colossal canyon on Mars can accommodate the whole U.S. territory and most of Cleveland. Well, let's figure out if it's true by talking about the most mystifying solar system facts. The solar system is 4.6 billion years old. So old, it's a senior solar system. Scientists came to this conclusion after they studied the oldest material they managed to get a hold of. And by that, I mean meteorites, of course. You won't be able to wear a hat on Venus, ever, and just try to stand on your feet. The planet is insanely windy. Its upper winds blow 50 times faster than the planet rotates. What's more, these fierce winds never stop and can get even stronger with time. Want to get away? You'll have to travel 11 billion miles away from Earth before ever leaving the solar system. Take your Google Maps with you. You probably heard of methane gas, a byproduct of natural processes such as volcanic activity and cows. Anyway, this gas is not only a part of the Martian atmosphere, but also the thing that confuses astronomers to no end. The thing is that the volume of methane on Mars keeps wavering, and scientists just can't figure out where it might be coming from. Can there be cows on Mars? As you may remember, Pluto used to be a planet but was stripped of this title in 2006. Later, it was reclassified as a dwarf planet. Gee, make up your mind! But the most unexpected fact about this celestial body is that its diameter is smaller than that of the US. See for yourself. The greatest distance across the country, from Maine to Northern California, is about 2,800 miles. As for Pluto, it's only 1,473 miles across. The planet Uranus, or Uranus, you can't win either way, rotates on its side, and astronomers have no idea why the planet has chosen such an unusual position. The culprits could be ancient mega-powerful collisions, but so far it's just a theory. By the way, this is the only planet laying on its side. Our Sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? Well, 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is in the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. Earth might not be the only tectonically active planet in the solar system. Astronomers have spotted some landforms looking like cliffs on Mercury. If it's so, the tectonic activity could explain the rapid shrinking of the planet. In most sci-fi movies about space, the main character gets into an asteroid belt and must dodge countless rocks that threaten to damage their spacecraft. Well, sorry to disappoint, but that's nothing like the real thing. The only asteroid belt astronomers know about is located between Mars and Jupiter. There are thousands of asteroids in this region, but they're so widely spaced that the chance of collision is next to nothing. Ah, you just ruined it. Sorry. Behind the orbit of Neptune lies the mysterious Kuiper Belt, filled with massive icy objects. The most curious thing about this space formation, though, is that scientists can't explain the pattern of its movement. The only explanation they have is that Neptune might be hiding a ginormous planet from our sight. This hypothetical planet has already got the name Planet 9, and all we have to do is wait until its existence is confirmed. Or not. Volcanoes on Earth are as different from those on Pluto as fire and ice. And I mean it. While we have volcanoes spilling lava on our planet, the volcanoes on Pluto spit ice. When frozen water expands, and this enormous pressure builds up until one day, bang, the ice erupts. In the process, a new cryovolcano gets formed. One of Saturn's moons, Lapidus, has a unique color. It's two-toned. One of its hemispheres is light and the other is eerily dark. Scientists haven't figured out this mystery yet. There's another weird thing about Pluto, or rather, about its atmosphere. First, it rises way higher above the surface of the dwarf planet than, for example, the Earth's atmosphere. What's more, 
the atmosphere on Pluto has more than 20 layers, and all of them are super cold and very condensed. We live inside the Sun. No, I don't mean that we're inhabitants of the red-hot ball of light approximately 93 million miles away. The thing is that the Sun's atmosphere stretches far beyond its visible surface, and our planet is right within its reach. In fact, it's the gusts of solar wind that create the breathtaking phenomenon known as the Northern and Southern Lights. The ocean on Jupiter is larger than any other on the rest of the solar system's planets. But wait! It's not the type of ocean you're thinking about. The one on Jupiter isn't made of water. This mesmerizing thing consists of metallic hydrogen, and its depth is a staggering 25,000 miles, which is almost the same as the circumference of the Earth. The Sun's atmosphere is hotter than the surface of the star. While on the surface, the temperature reaches 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit, the upper atmosphere heats up to millions of degrees. Scientists suspect that explosive bursts of heat from the Sun may have something to do with this unique phenomenon. People came to know about Saturn's beautiful rings in the 1600s. But only recently, it became apparent that Saturn isn't the only ringed planet. All the gas giant planets, Uranus, Neptune, and Jupiter, have rings of their own, but they're thin and almost impossible to see. As for Mars, Venus, and Earth, they're made of rocky materials and have no rings whatsoever. Our solar system isn't the only one in the Milky Way galaxy. Far from it. The galaxy we live in houses about 100 billion solar systems. And if that's just our galaxy alone, can you imagine how many there are in the whole universe? At any given moment here on Earth, you can stumble across a rock that's arrived from Mars. After scientists analyzed the chemical content of some meteorites found in the Sahara Desert, Antarctica, and other places on our planet, they came to the shocking conclusion that they have a Martian origin. Since Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun, many people simply assume that it's also the hottest. And that's where they get it wrong, because, in fact, Venus, which is about 30 million miles further from the Sun than Mercury, is way hotter. The thing is that Venus has an incredibly thick atmosphere, which is 100 times denser than the one we have on Earth. On top of that, this atmosphere consists almost entirely of carbon dioxide, also known as a greenhouse gas. These factors make the temperatures on the planet rise to a staggering 875 degrees Fahrenheit, which is hot enough to melt lead. As for Mercury, its maximum temperatures reach only 800 degrees. Jupiter's moon, Io, exists in never-ending chaos due to hundreds of smoking volcanoes on its surface. If you ever visit this place, send me a postcard. Now, you'll see the smoke from these volcanoes billowing up high into Lowe's atmosphere. The most enormous volcano in the whole solar system, at least that we know of, is on Mars. The size of this monster is almost as great as the state of Arizona, and its height is as big as that of Mount Everest. How did it grow this huge? The answer is simple. There's much less gravity on Mars in comparison with our planet. Even if you're a tiny celestial body, you can still have a moon of your own. Hey, it's not that hard. In 1993, the Galileo probe was traveling past a miniature asteroid that was no bigger than 20 miles across and discovered the little thing had a one-mile-wide moon. Since then, astronomers have found tons of moons orbiting minor planets in our solar system. The valley called Valles Marineris on Mars is more than 10 times larger than Earth's Grand Canyon. And it's another thing that puzzles astronomers. After all, Mars isn't a planet with active plate tectonics. On the surface of Jupiter, there's a weird region that's called the Great Red Spot. Recently, astronomers have concluded that this spot is actually a storm that's been raging on the planet for centuries. But some 20 years ago, scientists noticed that the red region started to shrink. Nowadays, it's just half the size it used to be. And still, the spot is one and a half times bigger than Earth. How about you? Do you know any other unusual facts about our solar system that I've missed? Then let me know down in the comments. If you learned something new today, then give this video a like and share it with a friend. But hey, don't go space traveling just yet!
we have over 2,000 cool videos for you to check out. All you have to do is pick the left or right video, click on it, and enjoy. Stay on the bright side of life. The sun's heat is beneath our feet. Scientists have figured out that Earth's core is actually as hot as the surface of the sun, around 10,800 degrees Fahrenheit. One of the reasons it's so incredibly hot down there is because Earth is still shedding heat from when it was created billions of years ago. Also, when an object as big as Mars slammed into the young Earth, it not only created the moon, according to one theory, but melted the surface of the planet. A lot of that extra heat is probably still stored inside the core. But there's no need to worry. The planet's core is harder for us to access than it is to probe the surface of Pluto. In fact, chances are we may never develop technology that could physically reach the core. There's no air on the moon. But then, how can it be rusting? Scientists have discovered the presence of hermatite on the moon, and it's a kind of rust. A special NASA research instrument examined the light reflected off the moon's surface. It turned out that the composition of the satellite's poles was very different from the rest of it. The moon's surface is dotted with iron-rich rocks. But without oxygen and liquid water, rust can't appear. Solar winds add to the mystery. They bombard the moon with hydrogen. And hydrogen makes it much more difficult for hematite to form. Even though the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, it still has some trace amounts of oxygen. Its source is our planet's upper atmosphere. Earth also protects the moon from almost 100% of solar winds, although not all the time. And even though our natural satellite is bone dry, there might be water ice in the shadowed craters on its far side. A day on Uranus lasts 17 hours, 14 minutes, and 24 seconds. But Get this, the planet has a tilt of around 98 degrees, and that makes a season on the gas giant last 21 Earth years. Mars has two moons, Phobos and Deimos. In the next 30 to 50 million years, Mars's gravitational forces will tear Phobos apart, and it will likely result in the formation of a ring around the planet. The Earth is the densest in the solar system. At the Earth's center, there's a core that takes up 15% of the planet's volume. It consists of two parts, the outer and the inner core. The inner core is a solid ball made of iron and nickel. Its radius is 760 miles, which makes 20% of the entire Earth's radius and 80% of the Moon's radius. The 1,500-mile-thick outer core is liquid. It also consists of iron and nickel, but it's not under enough pressure to be solid. Mars houses the biggest volcano in the solar system. While everything seems to be calm on Mars nowadays, in the past, some sort of force caused enormous volcanoes to form and erupt. One of these volcanoes is Olympus Mons. It's 16 miles tall, which is the height of three Mount Everests and 374 miles across, making it about the size of Arizona. The volcano grew to such a gargantuan size because of the weak gravity on Mars and the lack of tectonic plate movement. Gravity is not the same everywhere. The rocks, metals, and other minerals and substances that make up the planet are packed into the ground more tightly in certain places than in others. This has surprising consequences. Gravity varies slightly depending on where you are. You weigh 0.5% less standing at the equator than you do at the poles. In most cases, that's a difference of less than one pound. How high up you are also has an effect. So if you were at the top of Mount Everest, you'd also weigh slightly less. Just don't look down. Earth's toughest living thing is so small you can't see it. Water bears, also known as moss piglets, are cute little creatures with eight legs and squashed up heads that are less than a hundredth of an inch in length. Despite their microscopic stature, they can basically survive anywhere. They prefer bits of wet moss or the bottom of a lake, but they won't complain if you put them somewhere really uncomfortable. 
they can endure extreme cold and incredible heat and survive both huge pressure and high radiation. Some of the little bears once even managed to survive unprotected in outer space for 10 days without a problem. Huh, that is tough. They handle all these things by rolling up into a ball and hibernating, which reduces their need for oxygen and food. The moon's gravity is about 17% of that on Earth. If you weighed 200 pounds on our home planet, on the moon, your weight would decrease to a mere 34 pounds. You would also be able to carry stuff six times heavier than what you can carry on Earth. It would also be easier to walk on the moon's surface, but it would be more dangerous too. Your feet, inside a heavy spacesuit, would sink into the lunar soil up to six inches deep. But let's imagine you decided to skip the tedious process of walking by leaping through the air. Then you'd likely lose control of your jumps in no time. Plus, the moon's surface is littered with deep craters. It would be a tough feat to avoid all of them. You can see solar eclipses because even though the moon is 400 times smaller than the sun, it's also 400 times closer to Earth. So it's perfectly capable of obscuring the star. But in 50 million years, I won't be around then. The moon won't be able to block the sun completely because of the satellite's changing orbit. A full NASA spacesuit costs an unbelievable $12 million. Yeah, I can believe that. 70% of this hefty sum is for the control module and backpack. At the very center of Uranus, there's a rocky core, small, just half the Earth's mass. Compared to other planets, Uranus's core is rather cool, 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit. An ice mantle surrounds the solid core, and that's the largest portion of the planet, about 80%. It's also not the ice you might be thinking about. It's a hot, dense fluid made up of water, ammonia, ice, and methane, sometimes referred to as a water ammonia ocean. Uranus's atmosphere is mostly hydrogen and helium, but it has its blue-green color because of methane gas that absorbs the red light. The ocean on Jupiter is larger than any other in the solar system. But unlike Earth's oceans, it's made not of water, but of metallic hydrogen. The ocean's depth is a mind-blowing 25,000 miles. That's almost the same as the distance around Earth. Venus is a champ when it comes to volcanoes. The planet has about 1,600 major ones, but none of them is known to erupt. There's a supermassive black hole 250 million light years away from us. It hums the deepest sound ever detected from any object in the universe. It's 57 octaves lower than the middle C on your piano. That's one quadrillion times deeper than what we can hear. Mercury is a few billion years old. In 2016, scientists discovered some abnormalities on the planet's surface, showing that it's getting smaller. After more research, they found out that Mercury hadn't finished cooling down yet. There are planets that aren't bound to any star orbit and aimlessly wander through outer space. Among the most spectacular looking space objects are pulsars. Pulsars are a type of neutron star. They shoot out some of their material almost at the speed of light. Regular pulsars spin at a reasonable speed, between one-tenth to 60 times per second. But millisecond pulsars can spin at an impressive 700 times a second, which is way too fast for the human eye to even process. As they spin, they emit a beam of radiation from their axis that looks like the light from a lighthouse. Astronomers can notice pulsars when they face Earth, since it looks like a light being shined on our planet. When the light shines elsewhere, the pulsar can't be seen. Our Sun is insanely massive. Want some proof? 99.86% of all the mass in the solar system is the mass of the Sun. In particular, the hydrogen and helium it's made of. The remaining 0.14% is mostly the mass of the solar system's eight planets. Saturn's rings are very thin compared to its size. If you had a scale model of the planet that was three feet wide, the rings would be 10,000 times thinner than a razor blade. 
even though Venus is the hottest planet in our solar system, it still has snow. But not what you'd expect. It snows metals and rains acid. Not a great vacation spot. Imagine a still, frozen world. It's ancient, about 4.5 billion years old. It's barely heated by the rays of the sun and covered with a thick layer of ice. This world is smaller than our moon, but a bit larger than Pluto. Its name is Europa, the sixth satellite of Jupiter and one of the biggest moons in the solar system. But the coolest thing about this faraway place, it might host life. Astronomers consider Europa one of the most promising places in the solar system to search for new life forms. All because this moon has a huge saltwater ocean with a depth of 40 to 100 miles. Yes, it is hidden under a layer of ice that is estimated to be from 10 to 20 miles thick. But it is still potentially habitable. Astronomers claim that plumes of water erupt from cracks in the ice shell and release the contents of the moon's ocean into space. Of course, it's going to be challenging for any life-seeking missions to access such a deep environment. On the bright side, scientists already have some evidence that there are way shallower pools that probably lie much closer to the surface of the moon. They might be located even less than one mile under the ice. And there are two great things about this news. First of all, it boosts the odds of life existing on Europa. And secondly, if it's true, it can make it easier for future missions to find these life forms, if there are any. Interestingly, the new discovery about these shallow pools came about by sheer luck. The scientist leading the research, Riley Kohlberg, accidentally saw a presentation of his colleague, a planetary scientist. That scientist showed a picture of double ridges on the surface of Europa, and Kohlberg remembered that he had seen similar ridges on Earth. But while such formations are rare on our planet, they are way more numerous on Europa. The following studies suggested that the ridges on Jupiter's moon might be the result of a specific cycle, similar to that on Earth. In this cycle, liquid water freezes and then thaws inside an ice sheet, which is a rather high-pressure environment. This causes the sheet to move upward over and over again, creating a two-peaked structure. Or at least, that's what happens on Earth. If the processes on Europa are similar, it can prove the presence of shallow waters on the satellite. Of course, the temperature, pressure, and chemistry are very different on Europa. And scientists don't know yet how the ice behaves there. That's why they can't understand how deep or large the water pockets are, or how long they need to refreeze. But what is more or less clear is that such under-ice environments on Europa are very likely to be protected from Jupiter's harsh radiation battering the satellite's surface, which, in turn, increases the chances of life existing on Europa. Now, can we get back to the fact that the ocean on Europa seems to be salty? Red streaks on the satellite's surface might have this color due to their chemical content. They're likely a frozen mixture of water and salts, this is quite unusual because such a composition doesn't match any known substance here on Earth. As for yellow spots on Europa's surface, those might be caused by the presence of sodium chloride. You know this substance as good old table salt. Scientists tried to recreate the conditions on Europa in a lab. They discovered that by combining water, table salt, freezing temperatures, and high pressure, they could get a new kind of solid crystal. This substance might exist both at the bottom of Europa's ocean and on the moon's surface. But besides this information, researchers are in the dark. Hopefully, we'll find the answers to some of these questions around 2030. That's when a mission called Europa Clipper, which is going to be launched by NASA, will probably reach Europa. The mission is going to have several close flybys and figure out if any form of life can exist on the moon. The European Space Agency's JUICE, which stands for the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, is going to visit Europa in the next couple of years, too. But Europa isn't the only place in the solar system that might host or once hosted life. In 2003, Mars Express, a spacecraft launched by the European Space Agency, discovered methane in the atmosphere of Mars. On our planet, the biggest part of this gas in the atmosphere is produced by living creatures, for example, by cattle digesting food. However, 
Scientists think that methane was stable in the Martian atmosphere for about 300 years. And then, in 2006, the methane almost entirely vanished from the Red Planet. And it happened 600 times faster than researchers' models accounted for. The question, what or who generated the gas? And where did it go? Another Martian mystery is microbes that may be sleeping beneath the surface of Mars. There, they might have been protected from the harsh radiation coming from space for millions of years. Scientists simulated the conditions on Mars in a lab to check if it could possibly be true. And they were amazed to find out that bacteria could easily survive in such conditions for 280 million years. Which means that if life existed on Mars, we could find the evidence in the planet's subsurface by drilling into the Martian soil. Right now, there is no flowing water on Mars, and cells or spores would simply dry out. Plus, the surface temperature is similar to that of dry ice. In other words, the surface of the planet is deeply frozen. And still, there could be six types of bacteria and fungi living underground on the red planet. The most likely of them is nicknamed Conan the Bacterium due to its tough nature. Well, I guess time will show. Now let's move to Venus. In 2020, scientists announced that in the toxic Venusian atmosphere, there was something that might mean the existence of life. Unfortunately, scientists didn't have any evidence since there was no chance to collect any microbe specimens or snap any pictures of extraterrestrial life. But they claimed that they had discovered a chemical called phosphine there, and it was a big deal. If it wasn't some previously unknown chemistry that was producing this gas, then there could be some kind of microbial life involved in the process. Phosphine is made up of three atoms of hydrogen and one atom of phosphorus. This gas is toxic to any terrestrial life form that needs oxygen, including us humans. On our planet, phosphine can be found in places with no or little oxygen, for example, marshes and swamps. The gas is created by complex mixtures of bacteria living there. It can also be produced industrially. Come to think of it, phosphine isn't supposed to be in Venus's atmosphere altogether. This gas needs precise pressure and temperature and tons of hydrogen to form. It wouldn't be all that surprising to find it on Saturn or Jupiter famous gas giants. But on Venus, totally unexpected. There's no way phosphine can be naturally produced on this planet. Tiny amounts of it can be created during volcanic eruptions, lightning storms, minerals blown up to the surface, or meteorites entering Venus's atmosphere. But not as much as astronomers thought they had observed. And it had to make scientists suspicious. But they were too happy about their discovery. They probably thought it meant there could be life on Venus. But even if this gas was created by some mysterious organisms, it would be a big question how they survived on Venus. On our planet, some microbes can thrive in environments with an acidity of 5%, but no more. On Venus, though, clouds are almost entirely made of acid, containing more than 90% of sulfuric acid. The Venusian atmosphere is also 50 times as dry as the driest place on our home planet. And indeed, in 2022, thanks to better and more high-resolution telescopes, it was concluded that there was no phosphine in Venus's atmosphere. Or even if there was, it was a very small amount. So far, we need to look for signs of life further away from Earth. Now tell me, what's the scariest thing in the universe? What, besides Darth Vader and a lightsaber? Well, actually, I was asking about black holes, swallowing anything that comes too close without doubts or regrets. Blinding supernovae, mysterious hypothetical wormholes. Yeah, probably not because the most terrifying things in the universe are likely to be rogue planets. Ooh. Nomads, orphans, sunless, unbound. That is what these creepy worlds are called. They have no sun. Unwanted in their star systems, they were once ejected into the soulless emptiness of space. And some of them didn't even have their own star systems. They were born lonely. Rogue planets don't have sunlight. The never-ending night rains on their surfaces. No light means no warmth, and almost no chance of any kind of life to be able to survive in these frozen worlds. <laughs> How lonely! Kinda makes you tear up a little. Okay, I'm done. <clears throat>
But how do rogue planets get born? When planetary systems, including our solar system, form, it can get messy. Most planets appear from the cosmic dust that is floating in space around a newborn star. And when these planets form, they push one another. This gravitational game of tag often shoves some planets toward the edges of the newly formed star system. And sometimes, one or two of them get ejected from their home altogether. There are also nearby stars that can play with planets, too. Stars aren't often born on their own. Clusters of dozens to thousands of stars can appear in space. And in such a crowded environment, it's not a rare occurrence when a star with its own planets steals away a planet or two from another star. After getting a new planet, it can keep it for itself or throw it away into the dark, deep cosmos. Some free-floating planets pop up in a different way, with no parent star to help them. Like stars, they form from collapsed clouds of gas and dust. But since they are too weak, they can't put on enough weight and can't start nuclear reactions that make stars emit light. Such planet-like objects are known as failed stars. Or planets can go rogue after their parent stars disappear. Yes, sometimes stars go out, destroying some of their planets in the process. At the same time, the most distant ones, located in a safer zone, are left more or less intact. But the enormous force of a supernova ejects these planets away from the former star at a tremendous velocity. In any case, astronomers think there may be more rogue planets in our home Milky Way galaxy than anyone ever suspected. A recent simulation has shown there might be billions of them. But the problem is rogue planets are very hard to detect. You know, it's a tricky feat to find any exoplanet, even when it belongs to a planetary system. After all, planets don't give off their own light like stars. That's why when astronomers want to locate an exoplanet, they look for something blocking the light of its parent star. And it's usually the very planet passing between the star and the observer. But researchers can't use the same technique with free-floating planets because there's no parent star and thus there's no light to get dimmer. Another method of detecting exoplanets is the radial velocity method. It detects the planet's gravitational effect on its parent star. But, as you may guess, it doesn't work with rogue planets either. Luckily, there are still some ways we can detect these space wanderers. Imagine a line of sight between a telescope on Earth and a distant star. When an object crosses that line, its presence is likely to bend and magnify the light of the star. This makes it appear brighter than usual. The trickiest part is to figure out whether this object is a rogue planet. It's true that the stars whose light such celestial bodies bend can't be their parent stars. They're too far away. But there might still be a small parent star invisible because of the glare of the main star. And astronomers have to wait for a long time, sometimes up to a decade, for the main star to move a bit. Then they can finally check if there's also a parent star out there. If there's no parent star in sight, then it's proven. The planet is traveling solo. Not apparently. <laughs> so far, astronomers have identified at least 70 rogue planets or candidate rogue planets. At the same time, we know about more than 5,000 exoplanets in planetary systems. That's a huge gap that proves that detecting rogue planets is a tricky business. Interestingly, free-floating planets might not be as lonesome as we think. They can potentially have moons of their own. They might even take them along when they get pushed out of their cosmic homes. But could a free-roaming world, and possibly its moons, find a new home near a different star? Some experts think it's unlikely. The universe is a very spacious place. And even a large star with an incredible gravitational pull is hardly able to catch a fast-moving planet. For example, in 2017, an interstellar guest, an asteroid the size of a skyscraper, appeared in our solar system. It barreled through the solar system and just kept going without stopping or even slowing down. Now let's have a look at a rogue planet we have managed to spot. Just 20 light years away from the Sun, a bizarre rogue planet is roaming the Milky Way galaxy. And even though this planet doesn't orbit any star, it still has an incredibly powerful magnetic field, 4 million times stronger than that of our Earth. The exoplanet, with this crazy long name, 
also produces amazing auroras. When it was discovered a few years ago, astronomers were almost sure they had detected a brown dwarf. This is an object too large to be a planet and too small to be a star. But later, scientists got some evidence that the space object wasn't big enough to be a brown dwarf. The planet sure is a mammoth among its peers. It's 1.2 times as wide as the largest planet of the solar system, Jupiter, and more than 12 times as heavy. Astronomers think the exceptionally strong magnetic field helps the planet produce such auroras. But the most curious thing is that they're generated in a different way than auroras on Earth. It might be because the exoplanet's moon helps the planet create these light shows. To find more amazing rogue planets, NASA's Nancy Grace Roman Space Telescope is going to conduct a survey using the powerful techniques of a wide-field telescope. The stars in our Milky Way galaxy move all the time, and chance adjustments of the telescope can help researchers spot rogue planets. But there's one drawback. We won't know the distance to such a planet even if we find one. There's one more mission concept called CLEOPATRA, the clever NASA acronym for the Contemporaneous Lensing Parallax and Autonomous Transient Assay. See, I told you it was clever. It might be able to exploit parallax effects to calculate the distances to rogue planets. Parallax is a shift in the position of a foreground object when seen by observers in slightly different locations. Could Earth one day turn into a frozen sphere aimlessly floating through space? Mm, unlikely. Since our Sun isn't going to blow up one day, our world isn't likely to be pushed out of the solar system by our star going supernova. But a rogue planet could cause life on Earth to end. Oh boy. One day, such a space intruder might push Earth out of the habitable zone near the Sun and take its place. And our planet would have to retreat to an extreme orbit farther from the Sun. The climate all over the planet would start getting colder and colder, turning first half of the planet, then our entire world, into an icy desert. There would be a lack of food and other resources. It'd be getting darker and darker. There wouldn't be enough light for planets to get energy. They would wither, and animals that used to feed on them wouldn't be able to find food. Most species would go extinct. The farther our planet would be from the Sun, the weaker the star's gravitational pull on our planet would be. In the end, our beautiful Earth would get too far away from its main source of light and heat. It would turn into a lifeless piece of rock covered with a thick layer of ice. Wow, bummer. But hey, don't worry, I guarantee that will never happen. At least, not on my watch. Not on my watch. Let me take you to a place that seems to be out of this world. Life inside this cave has been isolated from the outside world for about 5.5 million years. And it does show. See for yourself. Due to such a long isolation, the conditions inside the Mobile Cave are like nowhere else on our planet. A unique ecosystem is flourishing there, even though there is a severe lack of sunlight inside the cave and the air is toxic. The cave, located a few miles west of the Black Sea in Romania, was first discovered in 1986. Nowadays, you can only visit it if you have special permission. Plus, the central caverns are guarded naturally by narrow limestone tunnels and vertical shafts. So, if you're no stranger to claustrophobia, you'd probably better not enter this place. In the depth of the cave, the air has twice less oxygen than the air outside. Instead, it contains a lot of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide so not the freshest air you can breathe. It's also pitch black inside the cavern. But despite, or should I say, thanks to, this cocktail of extremely harsh conditions, the site is a true goldmine for biologists. Shockingly, life seems to be booming here. In a 1996 study, scientists identified 48 species, and 33 of them were unique to the cave. Most of the creatures inhabiting the cave are tiny, with long limbs and antennae that help them navigate in the dark. They have no vision and lack pigment, and it makes sense. Why would you need to be able to see if you live in total darkness? And why would you need to be pretty and colorful with no one to see you? Now, I'm going to take you to another cave. It's no less amazing, but looks very different. This is the Giant Crystal Cave, aka the Cave of the Crystals, in Mexico. 
These ginormous crystals were found in 2000 by a mining company after the water was pumped out of the cave. Two miners then saw the crystals after entering the drying cave on foot. These awe-inspiring crystals are actually massive gypsum pillars hidden 984 feet underground. They're anchored to the walls and the floor of the scorching hot cave. Scientists estimate that the crystals could have been already growing for half a million years. That's why many of them are so long and wide that you can walk across them. Unfortunately, visiting this wonder of nature is impossible at the moment. But maybe it's for the better since the giant crystal cave is a dangerous place that can easily turn into a trap. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater, which was originally pushed upward into the opening by a magma chamber located in the depths of our planet. The magma under the cave kept the water hot, but eventually the temperature of the water dipped below 136 degrees Fahrenheit. As a result, the water started to fill with calcium and sulfate, whose particles began to recombine into gypsum. And then, white tinted crystals took over the cave. And since they stayed underwater, they were able to keep growing. You don't have to fly to space to take a closer look at a black hole. Scientists have found something very similar to black holes in the southern Atlantic Ocean. A black hole has such an enormous gravitational pull that once something gets pulled inside, it doesn't have any chance to escape. Even light can't get out of a black hole. But ocean black holes seem to be almost as powerful as their space relatives. But instead of catching the light, they do the same with water. Ocean eddies are massive whirlpools that spin against the main current. They usually swirl billions of tons of water and most of them are larger than a city. These whirlpools are so powerful that nothing trapped by them can escape. But the scariest thing is that you might not even notice heading into one of them. These things are so huge that you won't spot their boundaries until it's too late. When scientists started exploring ocean vortices with the help of satellites, they discovered the borders of several eddies. After that, they managed to prove that, mathematically, these whirlpools are the same as mysterious black holes in space. Massive eddies are surrounded by super tight barriers where fluid moves in closed loops. Even water can't get out from the inside of these loops. That's why tight ocean vortices play the role of enormous containers. Water inside them can be totally different from the ocean surrounding an eddy. And I'm not only talking about its temperature. The salt content inside and outside a whirlpool often differs as well. On the thin Curonian spit splitting the Baltic Sea from the Curonian Lagoon, there is one of the most bizarre places on Earth. Locals call this area the Dancing Forest because pine trees in this forest have shockingly unusual shapes. They twist in spirals and circles along the ground. There are some theories why it could be happening, of course. Some people claim that huge amounts of positive and negative energies once clashed in that spot. More down-to-earth individuals believe that the reason is geological. Sandy soil in the area is too unstable to hold trees growing upright. The most popular is the idea that strong winds blowing from the water influence the shape of the trees. In any case, experts haven't come to the final conclusion yet. Look at these underwater crop circles. For the first time, they were spotted in 1995, close to southern Japan's coast. Local divers called these seven feet wide structures mystery circles. The enigma had been plaguing many mines for almost 16 years until the culprit was finally caught. Imagine the researcher's surprise when it turned out to be a male pufferfish. The fish needs a bit more than a week to build one circle, and the aesthetics are obviously crucial. A male is swimming inside the circle, digging valleys in the sand with its fins. But that's not all. The fish also use shells and corals to decorate particular parts of their circles. This whole build a circle thing has a practical purpose as well. The way a male fish swims pushes the sand toward the center of the circle and creates a mound which later serves as a nest. The next mystery on our list is in the Caribbean. Just off the coast of Belize, there's a giant sinkhole. That's the Great Blue Hole. It's about 1,000 feet across and more than 400 feet deep. Once, a long, long time ago, this hole was a cave. But then rising waters filled it, making it collapse in on itself. The deeper you'll descend into the Great Hole's crystalline waters, the darker it will become. You'll see tons of stalactite-filled caves there, but entering them is extremely dangerous, unless you want to get hopelessly lost. Once you reach a depth of 50 feet, 
you'll notice that the water is shimmering. That's the invisible line dividing the sinkhole's salty top from the freshwater abyss. You might want to turn back right now. Who knows what you might come across in the murky depths. There was an old Amazonian legend that told about the river that was so hot that it boiled. And it was believed to be just a legend until Peruvian geoscientist Andres Ruzo questioned if the river could be real. All experts denied such a possibility. After all, hot rivers do exist, but only in the areas where there are volcanoes. As for the part of the country mentioned in the legend, there are no volcanoes in that region. But Andres Russo was too dedicated to give up. And in 2011, he finally located the river from the legends. The water in it was indeed steaming hot. Its temperature was 186 degrees Fahrenheit, not boiling, but pretty close to this point. But what shocked the researcher the most was the size of the river. One could think that the almost boiling water was the result of the activity of an underwater hot spring. But thermal pools are always small, while the river is 20 feet deep and flows for almost 4 miles. This is the only river of its kind on our planet.